I'm back with Marjorie Salson, who is the top speaking coach of the year by the International Association of Top Professionals. Now, before I go back to your ACE formula, Marjorie, uh, you said you're 77 years old. Now, let me ask you a question. Sure. When did you start the business that you're in now? When I started it as a business, it was actually a couple of years ago. But for many years, I was doing the same kind of work, but as a professional volunteer. I have volunteered for a number of organizations, been president and chair of this, that, and the other. And one of my jobs was as a uh, internationally accredited adult trainer for Women's League for Conservative Judaism. And I would go and do workshops and trainings for sisterhoods all over the U.S. and Canada. And very often, one of the things that uh, volunteers needed was help with speaking and convincing uh, how to sell people on what I think is the hardest sell, <laughs> donating to a worthy cause for nothing more in return than feeling good about something. And so I've, I did a lot of training. And by the way, I have a definition of a professional volunteer. It's my guess, Gail, that not only you, but many of your listeners have done some volunteering over the years. And my definition of a professional volunteer is that a, a professional volunteer is someone who gets aggravated for free. <laughs> well, you know, that's true. I have done a lot of volunteering for a lot of professional and uh, business organizations. And I have to, to, to laugh because I hope, folks, you're, you're realizing that what Marjorie just told you is that she was over 70 when she started her business. And she is very, very successful at it. So I don't want to hear from anybody, oh, it's too late or I'm too old or this or that, because she's a perfectly great example of somebody who's done it. And uh, I don't know if you were training people for the United Order of True Sisters. Do you know what that is? No, I, I don't know that organization. I think I've heard of it, but I, I haven't worked with them. Ah, okay, because my mom was a lifetime member of that. But um, uh, I want you to go back over the ACE formula again, because I want to make sure. So A is for? Acknowledge. Acknowledge. Okay, so you let people know. You, you let them know you've heard them. Yeah, See, that's a that's that, yeah. That's a great, it's as simple as saying, you know, that's a very good question. And as a matter of fact, listen to any news broadcast, listen to any politician, you will hear them using the acknowledge. And then they uh, go in their they, merry way. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. You will hear all the time. Now that you're aware, alert, uh, dear listeners, you will hear this all the time. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that's a really great question. Oh, thank you for asking me that or something along those lines. You are going to really be hearing this all the time now. Exactly. All right. So now we got acknowledged. C is for? Clarify. Because uh, what did you really hear them say? Yeah. You know, this is so important, folks. Let me tell you why. We speak, well, it depends on whether you're from the north or south or, or whatever, but you usually speak at somewhere between um, 150 to 200 words a minute. In the South, it's down to maybe 100 to 125, but somewhere in that range you're speaking. And people listen at four to 600 words a minute. So people are finished with what you're saying before you finish saying it. So <laughs> that's why you don't necessarily hear what people have said because you're off somewhere else thinking already. And uh, clarification is important. Okay, so E is for? Elicit. If you're in a group of people, ask other people, uh, you know, you haven't, you can say something like this, you know, this is not a topic I've given a lot of thought to. Is there anybody else who has some ideas about this or who can answer this question? Yeah, I have said that so many times. Wow, I never thought about that. I mean, it's really so true. I have to tell you, and I don't know how the listeners will feel about this, but I am a an avid TV watcher, not all day long. But when nine o'clock comes and I am through with my working day and so forth, I like to get into bed with my cats and <laughs> watch TV. And then I turn it off at 11 and I'm off to sleep. But I have friends, many friends, who A, don't even own a TV set, B, never watch it even if they do have a set, or watch it very selectively. So I think that's really important to elicit because there are subjects that people are fascinated with 
that you know nothing about. And then D is? It's either deliver or delay. If your dear subconscious gives you the gift of the answer that was lurking, you know, at the tip of your tongue or whatever, uh, or somewhere in, then you then you get the answer. You know, the an- I just got a gift from my subconscious. Here, here, here's here's what I came up with. Or you delay. You say, listen, this is a really great question. It's something that really deserves a. Uh, an honest answer. Let me look into it and I will get back to you within a day or two. And is there anybody else here who would like to to hear what the answer is once I get it? And the thing is about this, as I as I said very rush in a very rushed way, I was probably speaking more quickly than 150 words per minute. But when you can honestly say to people that you do not know the answer and that you will check into it. This does not in any way at all detract from your authenticity and from your authority status. It increases it because people know that when you give an answer, it's an honest answer that you are not going to try and flim flam and, you know, and, and, and make something up just to make yourself look better. And I'd like to go back, by the way, Gail, to something you were speaking about, if I may. Sure. And you were talking about how organizations should run. And I have many mottos, including that one about professional volunteers or somebody who gets aggravated for free. But one thing I truly believe is that everything is based on relationship. You. Oh, there's no question. I mean, uh, relationships are... Are, are so important because, I mean, when people, for example, um, uh, I, I just had someone send me some information about being a guest on the show. And um, there are two authors and, and uh, uh, anyway, one mentioned somebody who I have been a friend of, with for 30 years. And when I responded to him and I said, well, I don't care which one of you come on the show, but I want you to know that I've been a friend for years. And so one of them wrote me back and said, well, then any friend of his is a friend of mine and I'm going to be the one on your show. But it's a relationship. It's been a long relationship. We don't talk every day or even every month or even twice a year, but we know who each other is and we respect each other. And that is a relationship. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends or in contact with each other all the time, but you do have a relationship. You are absolutely right. And part of that importance of that relationship is respect. And one of the reasons I came up with this ACE method, which I guess I used informally, but had to formalize to help other people with it, is that it shows respect for other people when you are honest and you tell them what you do or do not know honestly. And it shows respect for yourself because you are holding yourself to a standard of honesty and that you know I always I always like it when somebody says they have too bad a memory to be a liar (laughs) yeah right well that's true it's so true that's what I always say I always say I tell the truth because that way I don't have to remember the story I made up you know because I'm telling you what it is but you know you brought up another thing too and that's relationships so so how do people you know Many people love to network, like I'm, I, I love to network. And other people do not like to network. I mean, it's like they're, oh God, no. And so what are your recommendations to feel more calm and confident in networking situations? Because I mean, there are some people who just abhor doing it. Well, p- part of the reason people abhor networking is because they don't understand what the real purpose is. A lot of people think that you go to networking events or you network with people in order to sell. That's not the reason you network. You go to networking events to build relationships. Correct. Correct. And 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 you go to that you go to serve not to sell. And so 
it's interesting that there are two very common questions that people are asked. The most common one is when people greet you, they say, hi, how are you? And nobody expects an honest answer that your left kidney is hurting or something. But the question that people expect an honest answer to, and this is whether it's at a, a formal networking event or just seeing somebody socially, they'll say, so what are you up to lately? Or so what do you do? And people do expect an honest answer. And one of the reasons people feel uncomfortable networking is they really don't know how to effectively answer the what do you do question. And so that's one of the things that I, that I work with people on is coming up with what I call an effortless elevator pitch <laughs> for people who, who want to be able to effortless, effortlessly answer that question. But one of the things that I have found is most important is to follow one of Stephen R. Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. And that's seek first to understand then to be understood. So if you go to an event and you meet somebody, a social event or business, whatever, and you are truly interested in them and ask them about what they do and why that's important to them and how did they get involved with that and what type of people do they serve and can you be on the lookout for them, uh, for people that, that might be interested in their services. When you show that kind of genuine interest to other people, guess what? <laughs> the, and people basically believe in, you know, tit for tat, quid pro quo, uh, you know, return of, of a favor for a favor, however you want to uh, say it. And so if you go to these events or you meet people and show a genuine interest in other people, they will return the favor and you'll feel a lot more comfortable because you're going there not to sell anybody anything. You're going there to be of service, to meet new people, to build relationships. Well, that's the thing. I think most of the time, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, well, yeah, they're shaking hands with me and looking over their shoulder to see who else is walking in the door. But it's true that when you go to a networking session, if you can be more of a connector, in other words, even if Marjorie, I don't like, uh, well, not like, but I don't, I can't use your services for whatever reason. I may know somebody who can use your services or Absolutely. I may say, you know, or I may say, you know, Marjorie, um, I really don't have any use for your services right now, but I'm glad to know about them because I may just run into somebody who needs someone like you. And I would love to be able to recommend you. Is that all right with you? And people really appreciate that. And that's the key to, I mean, I know somebody who um, was one of the top salespeople at a Fortune 100 company. And they offered him a manager's position, which he never wanted. He said, I'm a great salesman and a lousy manager. And he was a great connector. And he was always the top salesperson because he was always connecting people. And even when he wasn't you know, anywhere involved except to make the connection, and people were always recommending him and buying from him. So it makes a it makes for a, a really good situation, but you also um, I know have some tips on how people can improve the quality of their voices, or some tricks to make their voices more interesting and engaging. So what are some of those? Okay, well for, I want to say one more thing by the way about networking. That person who's you know talking to you and looking over your shoulder, part of networking is it's not selling, it's serving, but it's also sorting, sorting out the people who are not a good fit for you and just letting them go. True. That guy who's looking over your shoulder, that's not your person. Forget him. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I'm a not only, I'm a professionally trained singer and voice actor as well as a public speaker, by the way. And so a lot of what I'm sharing is comes from those two uh, trainings. One of the things you need to understand when you speak, and a lot of people hate how they sound, by the way. I, I've helped a lot of people with this. When you speak or you sing, your body is your instrument. So you got to keep it in tune. So, how do you keep your body in tune? Well, a lot of this sounds like something you may have been told as a kid growing up and you didn't want to hear. You got to get enough sleep. 
<laughs> and hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. The vast majority of people are dehydrated. By the time you feel thirsty, you are dehydrated already. And forget that whole business about eight glasses of water today, a day. I want to ask you, Gail, does that work equally well for Pee Wee Herman and Michael Jordan? <laughs> True, you know, different different body types, different different situations. There's a and also different climates. I mean, I find that when I'm out in, for instance, California, uh, out in the desert, I drink a lot more water than when I'm in Miami, where it's humid all the time. So absolutely, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. Okay, so and and there is a kind of a general rule of thumb, which is more than anybody's used to drinking, and that's half your body weight in ounces of water. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that's, that's 75 ounces of water. Oh my gosh. Now, a lot of times people will not hit that amount, whatever their body weight is, half of that in ounces of water, but aim toward it, preferably earlier in the day so you're not up all night. Uh, the other thing is, there's two other things. One is that a major resonating space for your voice is your mouth and a lot of people speak with their the back of their jaw their back teeth kind of clenched together and when you do that it cuts down on the resonating spots I mean you sound terrible <laughs> I don't even know how you do that I'm just trying to do that right now I'm like oh I can't it's, I mean all right so do that naturally I can't no you, but but they don't necessarily clench their teeth, which is, I mean, I was exaggerating for effect. But one of the things you can do that is very, not only improves the resonating space, you know, the, in your mouth, but also helps to relax you and helps you deal with nerves, is to yawn very widely. Not, not focus so much on dropping your chin, but focus on separating your back teeth so that you are, you know, stretching the muscles in front of your ears, basically. And I, I honestly think that this would help people who, who clench their teeth, you know, their jaws and grind their teeth, because they're, they have no relaxation in those muscles. And so when you yawn like that very widely, it helps to relax your jaw and it helps to relax you uh, physically. One of my early voice teachers was an opera singer and she told me about one of her uh, fellow opera singers and before every performance, this man would stand behind the curtain and yawn widely for like five minutes straight, breathing in and out while he was yawning just to increase that resonating space and help his voice be more resonant when he was singing. And the other thing that's important in your instrument is to treat your body, your voice, as if it were a pipe organ. A pipe organ does not work without air. And unfortunately, our voice does work without air. And a lot of people will start to speak without supporting their they're the sound with a breath. And, and that's when, where the diaphragm comes in. Right. And when yeah. you do that, when you don't use a breath, notice how the resonance in my voice kind of disappears. Right. Because I'm not supporting it when I take a breath before I speak. It immediately improves the resonance and the tonal quality of your voice. The other thing it does is it prevents your, vo your vocal folds which we usually call vocal cords, it, it prevents them from you know, getting so tired by the end of the day. If people have to talk a lot at the end of the day, if, if, if you're ending up with a sore throat and laryngitis, that is a sure sign that you are not supporting your voice with your breath and you are overworking your vocal cords. Yeah, it's... it's um... I, I was really fortunate because I went to um, Emerson College in Boston, which is a speech and communication school, and I had so many speech and drama and broadcasting classes that it was. I gave about 17 public appearances a week, and uh, I really learned to use my voice, which is, of course, kept me 
uh, really in good stead for everything that I've done with my business. So um, I, I think it's really uh, important that, you know, people realize what's involved here. So I want to tell people, though, to, how to get in touch with you and how to connect with you and, you know, how they can learn more about how you can help them. So I know you have a free report that you want to offer our listeners. So what's the best way for them to get that? Well, I do have a wonderful uh, report. It's uh, both a confidence-building report, Gail, and also inf good information about creating messaging that, that really resonates for you. And, and it covers what to say, how to say it, and allowing yourself, getting over the fears. And it's 10 powerful pathways to overcome your public speaking fears, even if you have struggled with them for years. And I have a wonderful URL. I just love this URL. It's overcomeyourspeakingfears.com. Fantastic. <laughs> overcomeyourspeakingfears.com. Just like it sounds. Overcomeyourspeakingfears.com. Right. Com, com, and then you will be able to get her free report on 10 powerful pathways to overcome your public speaking fears. That's fantastic. Well, you know, I, I just, um, I think it's fascinating that you led such an interesting life as a professional volunteer. I mean, I can just imagine because uh, if you've done that much training on people and, you know, it was all as a volunteer, I know that you have experienced just about every kind of uh, uh, situation you can possibly imagine. The only good part of that is as an unpaid volunteer, you can pretty much do what you want to do, even though you're under the auspices of various organizations. Frankly, if you wanted to tell them to go fly a kite, you could because <laughs> I've done not, it. <laughs> they're not paying you. So, you know, you can do that. But, um, you know, it, it is interesting. People say all the time, you know, well, I've stayed home or I've done this or I've done that. And now I'm 50. Who would hire me? And I always talk about looking at your life experience. And that's what you did. You looked at your life experience. You did some acting. Uh, you've done some voice work. You were a professional volunteer. And you took all of those things to go into business after the age of 70. And that's what I want everybody listening to this to understand. Marjorie is a poster child for what you can do. If you want to learn more about her and find out what she has done, go to overcomeyourspeakingfears.com because you'll be able to see from that what's important. So we only have about two minutes left, Marjorie. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like our listeners to know or that you'd like to tell them? Just this. I have to tell you, I'm always learning more and, and, and I'm a, a perpetual student. And my husband once said to me, when are you going to stop doing this? And I said to him, Gail, I am going to stop doing this when they plant me and not before. Well, so, you know, yeah. you and I have a lot in common, Marjorie, because people always say to me, when are you going to retire? And I say, never. And they say, never. And I say, no, why should I if I'm having fun? And they'll say to me, well, don't you want to do all the things you have the time to do with the things you want to do? And I say, I do all the things I want to do now. So what am I going to retire to? So I agree with you, Marjorie. Uh, good Bully for us. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. The thing is that, that there's always something new to learn, always new ways to expand your skills and grow. And to me, that's what keeps life interesting and exciting. People who retire to nothing. My husband uh, was looking at some people uh, that had retired and they were sitting in this uh, lounge looking at TV. And he said, he looks at them and, and some of them are snoring. Uh, you know, this was a men's health club. And other people, he says, you look in their eyes and the lights have gone out. Well, who wants to live like that? Exactly. And you know something, um, it's, it's so funny because my husband said the same thing to me. You know, when are you going to retire? Or when I sold my first business, he asked me what I was going to do. When I told him I was going on the speaking uh, circuit and he said to me well i hear you speak on it all the time who would pay <laughs> you to do that you know so i get it i get it 
Well, it's been a delight, Marjorie. My guest has been Marjorie Salson, top speaking coach of the year. You can get her information by going to overcomeyourspeakingfears.com. She's got a wonderful report for you, 10 Powerful Pathways to Overcome Your Public Speaking Fears. Thank you so much for being with us today, Marjorie. I know everybody enjoyed it. And let's hope we gave some women who are up there past the age of 60 and 70 the emphasis to go ahead and do it. Well, thank you so much, Gail, for having me. I've really enjoyed it. You're a wonderful interviewer, I must say. Oh, thank you.